Hey everyone, today we're talking about the question, Animal Man, and a bunch of other stuff from 52. If you haven't been following our videos concerning this year-long mini-series that ran back in the day, be sure to click on that button in the top corner. And while you're at it, maybe subscribe to Comic Island so you can get all our videos on comic books new and old. In the nation of Kondok, Rene Montoya is being held captive. These prisons are famously inhumane, and the woman witnesses this firsthand when the guards approach her and attack. So far, these men have just stuck to beating her. They want a confession. They want her to admit to the murder of nine men that recently occurred in the nation. But Renee and her colleague are innocent. They were framed as part of the work of a criminal organization called Intergang. As she is led to her interrogation, Renee is alarmed when she sees that her colleague's cell is empty, but relieved when some gas appears. When the guards mistake it for smoke, a voice speaks out, correcting them. It's called binary gas. Renee is glad to see Charlie, and he is happy to see her too. After all, they are in this together. Hiding out in Kondok, the two spend the next week regrouping and recovering in a shipping container the question had sent over from Gotham. The situation isn't ideal, and Renee begins to regret ever agreeing to work with this vigilante. They found each other after they, and the superhero known as Batwoman, discovered a plan by Intergang to invade and take over Gotham City using their extensive resources. It suddenly occurs to her what Intergang's next move will be and why they are targeting this nation. Today, the leader of Conduct, Black Adam, is set to marry his bride-to-be, a woman named Isis, and the terrorist organization is planning on attacking the wedding as they view Black Adam as a threat. After all, this villain has recently taken a very proactive stance in justice across the world, and Intergang feels he will be a huge obstacle once they seize Gotham City. The two rush to the site of the wedding, though they still have to keep a low profile due to their now fugitive status. The wedding is being attended by Captain Marvel and the rest of the Marvel family at Billy Batson's behest, as Billy believes that his longtime enemy has a real chance at redemption here. The ceremony commences with a show of powerful, magical lightning. Among the astonished crowd, Renee and Charlie desperately look around for any sign of intergang activity. To the rogue GCPD officer's shock, she spots a young child prepared to detonate a series of explosives strapped to her chest. Renee is unable to push through the crowd to stop the child, and though she is unwilling to do so at first, Charlie has to shoot the girl rather than allow for the slaughter of the massive crowd attending the wedding. In the hours that follow, Charlie repeatedly tries to reassure Renee had no choice in the matter, but it's of no comfort to the dead girl. That night, as Black Adam and Isis enjoy their first night together as a married couple, the staff quietly clean the child's blood from the ground. In honor of their efforts, Black Adam arranges for the pardon of the Question and Montoya, and prepares a ceremony to reward their heroic efforts. Charlie is present for it, always happy to have more friends, but Renee neglects to even show up. Black Adam is insulted at this move, but Charlie explains to the powerful leader that Renee feels particularly guilty about what happened. When Tethadam angrily points out Renee had no other choice, that the girl would have killed many people and intended on decimating the wedding, Charlie replies that Montoya simply doesn't see it that way, and is coping how she usually does. Confronting the woman, Black Adam finds her drunk and yells at Montoya, only for her to taunt the man even further. He grabs her by the neck and Renee tearfully begs the man to end her suffering. And this is only stopped by Isis, who points out that the woman's grief and her husband's anger are driving this argument. Charlie agrees, arguing that no amount of celebration can cover up the simple fact that a girl tried to blow herself up in the middle of a crowd. But it's the fault of the intergang and they must be stopped. And to that, Black Adam agrees. The group is able to discover an intergang re-education camp where a brother of Isis is being held. The boy has just tried to break out of prison, so the leader of the camp orders that this boy, Amon, be never given the chance to run again by destroying his legs, starting at the ankle. Watching this from the shadows, Renee wants to intervene, but Charlie stops her. Black Adam and Isis are on their way, and working together, they can stop these monsters. Two ordinary humans cannot. 
It's difficult, but if the two crime fighters go down there, they will die. There are some things you just have to accept. Not long after this, Black Adam and Isis do indeed arrive, quickly taking down the intergang cell. Renee is injured in the fray, but Isis is able to heal her thanks to her magical abilities gifted to her by Black Adam. They are able to recover the powerful woman's brother, and though she can heal his flesh, the boy will never walk again. So Black Adam approaches Amon and explains to the boy that Tethadam is now married to Isis. By right, he and Amon are now brothers by marriage. They have a bond, and to Tethadam that means everything. So he asks Amon to recite his new brother's name. With all his remaining strength, Amon manages to stutter out the words, Black Adam. With the matter of Intergang resolved, the now established Black Marvel family, grateful for the assistance of Renee and Charlie, agreed to take the two to the Himalayas, miles away from any civilized society, but feel surprised by this request and indebted to these vigilantes. Black Adam promises they will always be welcome in Kondok, while Amon, now going by the codename Osiris, points out he never would have walked again were it not for these two. Finally, Isis says they gave the family a gift of friendship, saved their wedding day, and most significantly, brought her brother home. She wishes for Charlie to always have more questions to ask, and Renee to find the answers she clearly needs. Montoya replies that the only thing she wants to know at the moment is how to stop Intergang from invading Gotham. Isis suggests that if that is the case, she might not be asking the right questions. The woman creates a rose and gives it to her friend, asking, who is Renee Montoya? With that, the Black Marble family leaves, and in the middle of nowhere in the snowy mountainous range, the two are greeted by friends of Charlie. Charlie introduces Renee to Richard Dragon, the man who taught him everything, and as of now, Montoya's teacher too. The group goes to the hidden land of Nanda Parbat, and time stops. Days, weeks, months, it all suddenly becomes unclear to Renee, whose life becomes an endless, difficult, and brutal routine. As for Charlie, he coughs, and coughs, and coughs. It started just after they arrived here. The man is sick and not getting better. As a smoker herself, she recognizes what is happening. And one day, she finally has the nerve to ask Charlie when he quits. He admits that clearly it wasn't soon enough, and states he only has seven months to live. Suddenly, this partnership of theirs, the purpose of it, their journey here, and Renee's path forward, it all becomes very clear. So she asks Charlie why, out of eight billion people on this planet, he chose her. That's the question, isn't it? The question, real name Charles Victor Saz, was created by legendary comic book artist Steve Ditko and first appeared in 1967 as part of Charlton Comics. Eventually, these characters would be acquired by DC and brought into their universe in the early 1980s, as many other characters in DC's roster were over the years. Ditko originally used the question as a vehicle for his own political views and philosophy, with a strong emphasis on his own libertarian and objectivist beliefs, which were, in turn, largely informed by Ayn Rand. And while I personally disagree with that political view, this is Ditko we're talking about, so they are artfully done and present their point of view in a very interesting way, even if I don't always agree with what he's saying. Once the question was brought over into DC, they kind of skewed this issue by giving him a more zen-like philosophy, something that had been established before 52, but is still very much present here. The old politics of the question that were once so heavily associated with the character by the time of 52 had long faded away. So while I would argue it's worth having a debate about whether or not that's a good idea in the larger sense of the Vic Sage character, those sorts of politics wouldn't really fit with the overall tone and aspirations of 52 itself anyways, so avoiding it makes sense here. Because 52 is not a very political book. It has some political attributes and references, sure, but at its very core it's not about politics or philosophy or any of the usual larger points fronted by Grant Morrison in his other works. That's not a criticism of the book, simply an observation. The purposes of 52 are largely a number of different, simpler goals. One, to orient new readers into a wider, deeper, and weirder world of DC beyond the top-shelf best-known superheroes. 
and two, to deliver an emotionally cognizant experience. So it's not a political book, but it's a very emotional one because I really feel and love the journey these characters go on throughout 52. The whole dynamic of Charles connecting with Renee and gradually passing the torch over to her over the course of a year that this comic takes place is really some moving stuff, and in my eyes really cemented Renee as an interesting character with a history worth exploring. It's a true shame a lot of this particular aspect of canon gets muddled in DC present day because I fell in love with these characters thanks to this story. But it's not just them either, I really connected with Black Adam and his family, as well as Steel and his niece Natasha. The scientists, Dibney, and the space crew, all these characters we haven't talked about yet, they all have some great moments. This comic does an uncanny job at getting you to really connect with all of these characters so that when things start to happen to them, and people die, you really feel that pain, even if you know it's not going to be permanent as I was talking about earlier. This is why I think 52 is somewhat divisive. There are people who really don't like this comic, and I'm certainly not one of them, but it does make sense to me. Something that is so primarily emotional is going to hinge very heavily on whether or not you connect with it, and whether or not that's going to happen is going to be determined on subjective grounds. And with something this complicated and dense, well, it was never going to connect with everyone, so it makes sense that not everyone loves this story. Because I did connect with it, I really felt it. I felt the loss of Charlie and so many others when they fall. And on the other hand, you feel their victories just as strongly. The other side of that is this is also a particularly dark story if you somehow haven't noticed yet. Kids are killed, Dibney's suicidal at the beginning of this thing. Again, if you connect with things, the dark tone is easily navigated and actually informs a lot of the losses that we feel along the way. On the other hand, if you don't connect with it, I imagine it would be a pretty miserable experience. In the depths of space, Lobo, Starfire, Animal Man, and Adam Strange, all stranded there as a result of the Infinite Crisis, are investigating a mysterious force that is reducing entire solar systems to dust. Worse still, whatever is carving this path of destruction is heading straight to Earth. The creators of the Green Lantern Corps, known as the Guardians of the Universe, can sense it too. Machines, the scale of which there are no adequate words to describe. They shatter planets before their followers emerge on inhabited worlds in the billions to chant the creed of their mistress, the Lady Styx. Where her army passes, it grows, with millions of new captives forcibly remade into her never-ending army. Believe in her, they scream. Believe in her, they chant. The Guardians order the recall of their Green Lanterns, for they cannot risk this containment spreading any further. But the adventuring group of Earthborn heroes aren't so wary, and know they are the only chance at stopping this force from reaching their home. With things looking bleak, and a new opportunity to return to Earth, they offer Buddy Baker, the Animal Man, a chance to go back to his family. But Baker correctly asserts that his family is the one in danger to begin with, if Lady Styx is allowed to run unchecked towards their home. So though he might be scared, like the rest of them, they have no choice. They must stop this. Of course, nobody said it was going to be easy, but they do have an idea for that, and it's a pretty good one. Lobo is a bounty hunter, and Lady Styx would pay a considerable bounty for the group. Head on against an army, they stand no chance. But who knows what kind of damage they can do in the belly of the beast. The plan works surprisingly well, and the team is able to overpower Lady Styx, and in the words of Lobo, explode her good. But it is not without cause. The animal man was hit with a neurotoxin and is unable to recover. As he lay dying, he tells the others not to worry. His family already knows how much he loves them. And he can see them right now. They're cheering the team on. The universe likes Buddy. It always has. So he has only one last request for Starfire. To promise not to let him come back as a zombie. And so ends the tale of the animal man. Meanwhile, Lex Luthor has become a popular figure thanks to his Everyman project. The program has been successful, with Luthor fronting his own team of superheroes called Infinity Incorporated, all handpicked by Lex as part of a team of heroes directly under Luthor's control, while many normal citizens are enjoying having access to their own superpowers for the first time. With so many wary of these heroes in the wake of the Infinite Crisis, 
it's of great comfort to them that this power is now in the hands of the people. However, as the year comes to an end, Lex begins feeling threatened by a new superhero rising in popularity, infuriatingly uninvolved with the Everyman Project, a mysterious man going by the codename Supernova. This, coupled with news that Lex himself cannot benefit from his own project due to genetic issues, compels Luther to stage a disaster and level the blame at Supernova's feet. As people all around Metropolis count down to the start of the new year, Lex prepares to shut off the powers of the hundreds of people he has granted enhanced abilities to over the last several months. Three, two, one. Flying heroes plummet from the sky, their energy triggering explosions as they hit the ground, with enough force to erupt gas lines, creating even further widespread destruction. In the ensuing chaos, Natasha Irons, niece of the superhero known as Steel and member of Infinity Incorporated, is relieved to see her and her team still have powers. As they rush to help citizens, Natasha can't help wonder though why that might be, and as Supernova flies ahead, she wonders if this mysterious hero and her uncle were right to be suspicious of Lex Luthor all along. Without a doubt, one of my favorite aspects of 52 is its ability to show off some of the more obscure DC characters. With new versions of the question, Batwoman and Steel being floated around while simultaneously making these incredible developments among long established characters ranging from Tio Moro to Will Magnus, and clear favorites of Grant Morrison like Animal Man also being featured, we get this wonderful buffet of characters new and old. This is why 52, though a long ass series, is absolutely a recommendation of mine when it comes to new DC fans. It asks a lot out of you and not everything might make sense but they make the story very fun and interesting while informing you of plenty of little details about the DC universe and its history along the way. I consider 52 a central reading now for characters like Black Adam and The Question in particular. Originally, this story was meant to be sort of just a content bridge, explaining and going over the many changes that resulted from the Trinity walking away from their superhero roles for a full year. But it becomes more than that. A clear statement from DC of change without abandoning old ideas either, though it had a lot of issues when it comes to the follow-up of this little blueprint they sort of created out of 52, I find the blueprint itself very rock solid, especially in how it works with these characters, even as it navigates some remarkably dark and bleak waters. I often say my issue isn't with their content so much as my standards for that content are much higher than lighthearted stuff, and 52 is a prime example of dark DC stuff done at least relatively well, enough so that it can be enjoyed. Though we'll talk more about the limitations of that later, and it wasn't something new at the time, rather it's a clear endorsement of something I'm a lot more neutral towards, something DC had already been doing for nearly two decades by the time 52 came out. DC was changing for the modern age. And that's it for part two, next up, We'll be going over World War III and the end of 52. Thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you next time here on Comic Island.